Good evening and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And you have myself, Stephen George. Good evening. Good evening. It's Sunday the 20th of March 2016 and we're in Studio One with all the new setup. It looks fantastic, I have to say. The studio looks brilliant. The only thing we don't have working is the phone system, which Steve is going to tell us about in a minute. Now, we have a busy schedule. We have a pre-record with Catherine Albrecht, which we're going to be playing shortly. And we'll do Alan and Steve's week and the other bits and pieces at the end of the show. And then after that, we have a guest on at 8 o'clock. We're going to be talking about curing cancer naturally. So he'll be on hopefully at 8 o'clock, and we'll see him then. But before we do anything else, let's find out what the communication channels are. Yes, communication channels this evening are as follow. The communication channels are email, info at oymireland.com, by phone 046 1212 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Thank you, Mary. 0469271212 is the phone number for the studio this evening. However, uh, because of the, the kind of the rebuild of the studio, the phone system is currently down at the moment. We're awaiting for some uh, some specialist cables to come in uh, so we can get them up and running. So hopefully that will be up and running next week. Uh, what else we got? We have Facebook, the anti-social media. If you want to find out more about us uh, and, and you're on Facebook, go to oimradio.com. You will see the Facebook link there. You can befriend us and you can post on the page and all sorts of Facebooky things. We don't tweet, so no Twitter. Uh, what else have we got? We have the TuneIn Radio Link application. That's there on the website as well. And speaking of the website, oamradio.com, you will see the live chat button on the left-hand side. That's where you can log in and ask questions uh, for our second guest this evening because the first, as Alan mentioned, is a pre-record. So we will be tic-tacking with you on the chat room, but I'm sorry, we're just going to have to guess your questions. Well, let's hope we did. Uh, I'm going to say hi to everyone who's already logged into the chat room and also PIR, People's Internet Radio chat room as well. So a big hi to everybody there. Brilliant stuff. Um, well, so while Steve gets the uh, pre-record ready with Catherine, we'll just let you know that we can take phone calls. It's just not patched in to the actual um, system, so you won't be on air. But, you know, it'd be, it's a pre-record that we're going to be doing anyway. So, Steve, we won't uh, we won't hang about because this is a, an hour interview with uh, Catherine Albrecht. So uh, loads of information from Catherine. So we'll get that started. And... Um, Steve's just looking for the... Yeah, that's... <laughs> the whole new I setup. nearly made a big mistake, you wakey there. The, the whole new setup, you see, it's all changed around here, so we're just getting used to it. Okay, so we're going to kick off the uh, pre-record with Catron, and uh, we'll see you on the far side. Good evening, Catherine. Thank you for coming on to the show, OEM Ready. This is our second uh, show with you, part two. And uh, much, uh, I know you're very, very busy and y- your schedule is, is chock-a-block. But again, thanks for coming on. Tonight, what we'd like to do is cover smart meters. And it's something that we are going to, um, apparently we're going to be getting to Ireland in 2018. So, and it's something that we, we mentioned to you before on part one that we'll have to talk about. So, uh, again, thanks for coming on. I hope everything's okay your end. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm so glad to be back, and I'm glad we get a chance to follow up because we, we, it felt like we just got started last time. On the smart meters, I actually have quite a bit to say about this, but it may be in a, a different direction than some of your other guests. The, the issue with smart meters is a health issue, of course, and I think a lot of people are concerned about that. But I think on a, on a broader level, the smart meters are part of this concept of a smart home to where all of your appliances are going to be reporting, whether they're reporting to your smart meter, which is then sending information out to a central hub so it can go back to um, not only the power company, but potentially marketers, potentially hackers, potentially government officials. But I think the vision of the, the home of the future and the smart meter is just the tip of the iceberg, just the beginning of it, is a home in which everything is communicating. So right now what the purpose of the smart meter is, and on, on some level, if we lived in a perfect world, it makes sense that rather than have a meter reader go from door to door, from property to property, uh, fighting dogs and going through fences in order to get to the meters on the sides of people's homes, what the smart meter allows the uh, meter reader to do is simply to get in a truck and drive up and down the street and as they come within a particular range of the meter, the signals are simply picked up and stored in a computer on board the truck. And, I, again, if we lived in a perfect world where we didn't have privacy concerns, 
where we didn't have electromagnetic radiation health concerns, where we didn't already know, based on 15 years of watching what the Internet's been doing, that big corporations will take advantage of any opportunity they can get to access people's data and exploit it and abuse it and misuse it, then I would say, nothing wrong with that. It sounds a lot more convenient. But given that we know that exposure to EMF radiation is is a, a potential health hazard, and given especially that we know the, the long-term plan of what's called the smart grid, the idea that the electric companies will not only be serving electricity to your home, but they will also be picking up information from your appliances, and they will have two-way communication. So let me put this in perspective, and we've seen an example of this in Austin, Texas, where my daily radio broadcast was actually started almost 10 years ago. And I live up in New Hampshire, so I'm, I'm thousands of miles from Austin, Texas, but I know from my listeners that they have a program in Austin that went into place a number of years ago, It was a trial program that's now going to be rolled out in cities all across the U.S. and possibly in Ireland as well. And what this program does, now, Texas is a hot state. It's in the American Southwest. It's out by the desert. And it gets um, very, very warm there. I don't don't know in Celsius, but in Fahrenheit, it can get over 100 degrees, which is pretty darn hot. Mm. And when that happens, the residential air conditioner use goes through the roof. People start turning on their air conditioners, and the hotter it gets, the more drain on the power grid occurs. Now, what the, the, the power companies won't tell you is that residential use of power is a totally small percentage of overall use of power. Most of that is being used by industry, by factories, by uh, office buildings, turning on their lights, running fax machines and copiers and computers, etc. So it's really just a small fraction of the overall electricity usage that is being taken up by consumers. Nevertheless... When you have, it in, in the case of Austin, Texas, an extremely hot day, they wanted the ability to reach in through the smart grid and actually turn people's air conditioners off. And so what they offered, and it was actually quite clever, was a program in Austin where if you were a landlord or a homeowner, you could obtain a free thermostat. This is the, the item that goes on your wall where you set the temperature. They can run... Oh, 75, 100 bucks a piece if you go and buy uh, an electronic one at a Home Depot. They can run maybe 30, 40 bucks if you're a landlord and you buy them in bulk. But they offered them for free with one catch. And the catch was that the thermostat was actually a radio, um, uh, radio frequency transponder that could pick up and respond to a signal sent to it. And so on a hot day, the power company in Austin could send out a signal to all of the receiving thermostats that had participated in this program and say, you set your thermostat to a nice cool temperature, well, we're just going to bump that up a few degrees so it's uncomfortably warm in your home, but so you're using less electricity. And the the thinking behind this, I think people have to understand that this in, in miniature is what eventually the power companies and the powers that be want to do with all of our appliances. So the idea is once you have a smart grid, once you have smart appliances, then they will be able to be communicated with, whether it's through a radio signal like they did in Austin, or whether it's through simply the power lines themselves, that they could send a signal to your washing machine, for example, and say, this person is using too much water. So they're only going to be allowed to do three loads of laundry a week. It doesn't matter that they have a family of six. Or... This um, time of day between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. is when the offices are using the most electricity, and therefore your dishwasher simply won't turn on during those hours. You can push the button all you want, but until we send a signal that says it's appropriate for your dishwasher to wash the dishes, it's just not going to work. So I think the smart meter is really the opening gambit in a move to take over all of your appliances, and to really take over the control of electricity to your home. And that's really the bigger picture that, that I'm concerned about with the smart meters. Yeah, and also we have the the, uh, the privacy issue as well, which the, we know they're concerned about over here. And the privacy issue, of, as we've been told, is that they can tell when people are having showers, when they're in the toilet, and many people are in the house. Just so much private information, which is a big concern. 
Yeah, I I remember a number of years ago, I actually got my start as a consumer advocate, as a doctoral student at Harvard, when I realized that I was carrying around all of these supermarket frequent shopper cards. And for a number of years, I, I, I probably have become, I, I did my Harvard doctoral dissertation on this topic, and I probably became the world's leading expert on supermarket loyalty cards. And in the course of doing that research, one of the things that I ran across, which really chilled me, was a claim by one of the companies that processes the data from the supermarket membership cards. And they were boasting in this internal document that they would have been able to detect the home that Anne Frank was in and actually to know that that home was harboring Jews. And you may recall the story of Anne Frank who hid out in a a kind of a, a false wall, behind a false wall with her family for a number of years until they were turned in by their neighbors and, and killed in the Holocaust. And this company, I think with, with a complete obliviousness to the inappropriateness of what they were saying, was saying that they would have been able to, um, that Anne Frank couldn't have hidden from them, that they would have known that she was there. And what their claim was, that they would have known, and you, you'll never guess how they thought they would have figured this out, they would have figured out that there were more people than the home claimed, not on the basis of the food consumed, because everybody was under rationing, as you'll recall. Mm. And so everybody in the house just ate less so they could share their food with the family in their attic. But they claim that they would have known this on the basis of the toilet paper purchases of the family. That simply having that many people in the home, you can't ration toilet paper the same way you can ration food. Whether that's true or not, I don't even want to think about. But uh, that was their claim. And they said that if there were a home that claimed four people, but there were really seven people, that they would know that because of the toilet paper purchases. Now, let me take that to the next step. With a smart grid or a smart meter, not only would you know that on the basis of increased electricity consumption or lights going on in a part of the house that wasn't supposed to exist, but even more chilling still, you would know it because in the home of the future, the actual light bulbs themselves, as is claimed by the companies that make them, will be outfitted with microphones. So unless Anne Frank and her family were going to be as quiet as mice and never speak a word to one another ever again, the actual appliances themselves could have been reporting on them, listening to them, spying on them, and sending the information back to those companies. Yeah, just in relation to the the light bulbs, uh, Catherine, um, if you had said this to anyone a couple of years ago, they would have wrote you off the page and said, no, you're a conspiracy theorist, and that would never (laughs) happen. But when you just look now with smart TVs, and people are bringing these into the home, and, you know, we we already know that smart TV has a built-in microphone, and some of them have built-in video capabilities as well, and people are controlling their TV with their voice, and they think it's fantastic. You know, some of these tech gurus, they think it's great. You just have to say, TV on, change channel. And this, it, it happens automatically, but what they don't actually realize is that, you know, uh, the TV is listening all the time for you to give it commands, and, you know, uh, who's to say that no one or other people, persons unknown, uh, may or may not be listening to you, whatever's going on in your home, in your room. And just um, the loyalty cards for the supermarket, I actually had a chat with uh, two people that I work with only only this week, and I was talking about that. And uh, because there, was, there happened to be an ad on, on one of the radio stations that was being listened to in the in the kitchen in the canteen, and they were talking about your loyalty cards and all this carry on, and I said, I asked just asked a few people. I said, how many how many of you have these cards? And a couple of them says, oh yeah, I have one here, and he showed me it's on on his key ring for his car, and I says, uh, where do you think the information goes? And he says, oh go, it just goes to the shop, you know, the store. And then they'll send me out some some vouchers every so often, you know, money money vouchers off stuff that I we tend to buy regular. And I says, what would you say if I told you that the information could be sold on to insurance companies, life insurance companies, and if you if your diet consisted of fried food and fatty foods all, you know, then when you went to apply for uh, life insurance, that your policy could be loaded. And you wouldn't have a clue as to why, but it's be you know because they would know uh, your consumption of. Or well, your household exactly. consumption, and and it's, and it's they, crazy. and you want to see the the stairs that I got back, Catherine. It was, I mean, I know this information is true. You know this information is true because the last time you were on, you told us all this, and the faces looking back at me in disbelief, and you know, it's not as if they were shocked. They were just kind of, 
Now, that had never happened. Now, there's something wrong with you. And I said, no. I said, not only uh, could it happen, I said, it is happening. Yeah, I think um, it's it's a strange phenomenon because what happens is these things get put in place quietly. No one knows that they're occurring. And then by the time someone actually figures it out, the response by the industry is, well, where have you been? We've been doing this for years. Nobody's been complaining so far. So why are you making a fit about it? Go back to sleep. And so I think I actually read an essay a while back called It's Never There's Never a Good Time to Criticize Technology. You're either jumping the gun and you're predicting problems that haven't yet happened, which is what happened with our book Spy Chips, which came out ten years ago to warn about these issues. And the response of the industry was, Come on, we, we may have discussed those things, but we're not doing any of those things. And I was really trying to sound an alarm that, hey, this is what they're talking about doing, and unless we stop them, this is the plan. And every single thing that we outlined in the book Spy Chips 10 years ago has actually now been coming to pass. So it's a really great way to figure out what's going on right now. I don't know that anyone else has written a book about these these um, plans, technologies, things that are underway behind the scenes, uh, because really no one else has written that book. But at the time, it was, oh, come on, it's too early. You're, you're complaining about things that don't exist yet. We're not going to listen. And I think today, if someone were to come out with that same book and make those same claims, the response would be, oh, come on, we've been doing this for five years. Nobody's complained so far. This is the way things are. It's inevitable. Get with the program. Suck it up. So there really isn't. The, the way the dialogue has been constructed, there's never a good time to complain. If you complain too early, if you complain when it's first being introduced, it's, oh, well, we don't know the risks yet. Don't worry about it. Let's just test it out and find out. Uh, I think famously, um, was it Hillary Clinton on the health care bill? It wasn't Hillary. Who was it? I'm trying to think which of our illustrious lawmakers in the U.S. said, we've got to pass the health care bill to figure out what's in it. You know, <laughs> this yeah. kind of attitude of we're going to introduce something that's potentially dangerous, but we we need to introduce it so we can figure out what the dangers are. And then this other attitude, which is, what, you're just now telling me this? You mean it's already happening? Well, if it's already happening, then there's nothing I can do about it. I'm going back to sleep. Mm. And so I'm guessing that even when you informed your friends about it, their first response would be, oh, you're crazy, it's not happening. And then you provide evidence, and then their attitude is, oh, well, if it's already happening, there's nothing we can do anyway. So it really is, um, it's, it's a mind trap. It's a way to prevent people from ever feeling that they have any power over the direction society is going. And the reality is society is us, and we have all the power. We're the ones who determine where it goes. It's not some juggernaut that's, that's outside of our control. We are the members of society. We are the people of planet Earth. And if we don't decide where it's going, then nobody's deciding where it's going. Or as, I, as I've argued elsewhere, it's a spiritual battle, and somebody outside of us is deciding it. But somebody's deciding it somewhere. And unless we take the, the bull by the horns, unless we wrest away the steering wheel from the crazed bus driver who's driving us into the swamp, then we're not going to be in control of what happens, and it's not going to go well. Exactly. I, I, I agree 100%. Um, just in relation to little small victories, just a little small uh, kind of short story as well, um, in relation to dangers of technology, uh, the likes of mobile phones, uh, people were, were, I've been warning people for a long time not to carry, especially males, not to carry your phone in your front pocket near your, you know, your crown jewels. And, uh, uh, one of the, one of the lads that I know, he's been kind of saying, ah, that's, a, that's all, BS, and he wouldn't believe it. And it was only this week when he actually came to me. This is one of the chaps that I work with. He came to me, and he said, "Did you did you see that 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 story that's going around?" And I said, "What story?" He said, "There's some some research has been done, and it was in the paper, or it was, it was either in the paper or on the on the TV." Oh, it must be true yeah. then if it's yeah. in the paper. Yeah. And he said, <laughs> but, but, "No, but the gas thing was, he said, the the information was saying that you shouldn't carry your phone in your front pocket if you're a male because it may affect you, you know, sterility. It could cause sterility and all this." And I said, "Really?" I said, uh, "Do you recall anyone telling you that before?" And he said, "No." And I said, I've, I've told you that. I said, I've said it to you before because you always seem to carry your phone in, in your pocket. And he says, oh, I won't do it anymore. And I said, yeah, but how come you, you, you listen to what's on mainstream media, but you won't listen to me? I said, and I, I'm getting the information, I said, from people in, in the know. 
you know? Yeah. But then we, do, then we say this before, that if it's, in, if it's on TV, they'll believe it. If it's not on TV, they won't believe it. That's yeah. how much control yeah. the mainstream media have. But um, just going back to the smart meters, Catherine, now maybe you can kind of give us a, a history lesson here in a way. You, you kind of know what's going on over there in the States. But everybody remembers probably the, the, the movie Aaron Brockovich. And at the moment, Aaron Brockovich is on the warpath. And fair play to her regarding the fluoride in the water. And she's saying that Irish women should not be drinking the Irish water uh, because of the fluoride being a neurotoxin. Now... When Erin Brockovich in the movie, she took on a massive company called P&G and they were poisoning the water in the local area and they had a, you know, 480 million or something plus claim which they won from P&G. Now, as far as I know, and maybe you can confirm this for us, Catherine, P&G are actually dealing with the smart meters over there in the, in the, in the States. I'm sorry, you, you lost me on the P&G, because yeah. um, I, I, I was going down a water road, and I just wanted to mention that we had really serious water problems in Detroit, and it's it's a belief that an entire generation of children in Detroit has been actually lead poisoned by their decision to divert a local lake water into their water supply, and this is very polluted water that corroded their lead pipes. So... Um, when you're talking about water, I'm just thinking, my gosh, we have such precedent for concerns about large-scale government decisions that create massive amounts of trauma that we only find out down the road. When they diverted the water, they actually had it running into the Detroit taps for a number of years before it was discovered that children were, were developing lower IQ scores, that they were actually developing brain damage because of this water that they'd been drinking. So... Are we going to see the same thing happen with smart meters? I mean, I've, I've heard from people, certainly in the U.S., who have contacted me, who have said that they weren't even aware that a smart meter had been put on the home where they were staying. Perhaps they were in an apartment building, or um, in one case it was someone who was uh, staying in someone's guest room, and they didn't even know that this had happened, and yet they began experiencing difficulty sleeping, headaches, um, what what I guess would would commonly be referred to as electromagnetic sickness. And it was only after they discovered that there was a smart meter on the home where they were staying where they said, oh. And oftentimes this can be alleviated by simply moving away from the wall. And I'm not saying that we should all just accept these things. I think people should fight. But if you've got a smart meter on your home, at the very least, get yourself away from it. You don't want to be sleeping in its little cloud and the, the, the way these things work, the further away you get from them, the vastly reduced uh, amount of radiation you receive. So if you've got one on the other side of a wall, you definitely don't want to sleep with your headboard of your bed against that wall. You probably don't want to sleep in that room. You probably want to move to another room. And there are shielding fabrics that you can purchase. There's a company, which I believe still exists, called lessemf.com. And they actually sell shielding fabric, so you can actually buy curtains or line your curtains with shielding fabric that will actually block the electromagnetic radiation emitted by uh, one of these smart meters from actually even getting into your house. Yeah, the um, we have had people on the show suffering from the electric hypersensitivity, which is a, a condition that's recognised in Sweden, but not recognised uh, in, the, in the rest of the countries in Europe. I don't know whether it's recognised in the States. And uh, there are kind of some sceptics out there, uh, experts, obviously. Maybe they're working for the companies that develop the technology who are saying that it's kind of um, uh, uh, the psychosis more so than anything else, um, rather than actual people suffering from it. You know, it's just well, tr tricks of the mind. Absolutely. And let, let me see if I can address that, because I think when, when we look at effects of things in a, in a laboratory, and I have a doctorate, so experimental research was a, a big part of my training. When we look at effects on people, because of the nature of, of just life and research, we tend to look for immediate harm. So if I want to say, if I hit people in the head with a hammer, are they going to be harmed? Then I could get 100 people in a room. I couldn't really do this ethically. But if I hit 100 people with a hammer, probably 100 of them would need to go to the emergency room. Mm. On the other hand, if I took 100 people and I gave them a glass of Detroit water and then tested them afterwards and said, well, your IQ doesn't seem to have gone down. You don't need to go to the emergency room. You look fine to me then I could not safely conclude at that point or reasonably conclude 
that that water was safe to drink. So I think there's a real important distinction people need to make between immediate harm that's directly visible and harm that takes place over time. And so in the case of electromagnetic radiation, some people believe that they are impacted immediately. If they get within range of one of these signals, it actually affects them. I can't say whether that's true or not, but I can say myself, and I I may have talked about this on a previous show, that I actually developed two large brain tumors in my head, located right behind my ears. I had an 11-hour neurosurgery about a year ago, and they had to go in and remove these tumors. I almost died. I came very, very close to dying. And when they removed the tumors, very interestingly, the tumors just happen to be located exactly where I hold the antenna of my cell phone. And if you hold a cell phone up to your head, which I haven't done in over a year, but if you do, then you know that almost always you hold the phone on one side of your head, and if that side gets tired or sweaty or it gets sore, then you move the phone and you hold it on the other side until the first side stops feeling tired. And that's probably 80% of the time on one side of your head, probably 20% of the time on the other side of your head. Well, interestingly enough, the tumors were not only located in the precise location of the antenna of my cell phone right behind my ear, but they were also, there was one that was large on the right-hand side of my head where I always hold my phone, and a small one on the left-hand side of my head where I rarely hold my phone. Now, I've been using a cell phone for probably 15 years. Did I develop cancer the first time I held a a cell phone up to my head? No. But over time, if I was going to develop a cancerous tumor in my brain, and I guess I was just destined to do that, it's very interesting to me that that tumor just happened to occur right where the cell phone radiation centered. And it's important that people understand that there is no dispute. This This is an open fact that when you hold a cell phone up to your head, you summon glucose into that area of the brain. So not only do you have a slight heating effect on that part of the brain, which may or may not be good or bad for you, who knows what what that's about, jury's out, but it is a known fact that when you put radiation up to the brain, that glucose will circle or center or or, uh, flow into that part of the brain. Now, why is that important? Because glucose is basically miracle grow, it's fertilizer, it's fuel, it's gasoline for, for tumors. So cancerous cells are unlike other cells in that they're voracious consumers of sugar. So your regular cells consume a normal amount of sugar so they can just do their normal function. That's fuel for all cells. It's fuel for life. It's the thing that keeps your body going is glucose. But a cancer cell is very different from a normal cell in that it wants to grow like mad. That's how it kills you. It wants to grow like crazy, and it wants to multiply. And if it doesn't get sugar, it can't do that. Mm. When, when you're tested for cancer, when you get a PET scan or a CAT scan or an MRI, what they do is they actually, I'm not sure this is the case with the MRI, but it's certainly the case with a PET scan. They inject you with a radioactive form of glucose. And the reason they put this through your entire body is because when the radioactive glucose is in your body, your body doesn't know it's radioactive. It just goes, oh, here's some glucose. The normal cells go, whatever, glucose, fine. We, we, you know, we'll use it when we see it, when we need it. But the cancer cells go, ooh, yum, 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 glucose, got to suck it up. And so if there are cancerous tumors in your body, when they inject the radioactive glucose into your body, the cancer cells suck it all up. And so then when they do a scan, They simply look for areas of radiation within the body. And if there is a tumor, it will light up like a Christmas tree because it will have consumed all of that glucose and it will thus be radioactive. So this is really important to understand. And by the way, it's very low levels of radiation. They're not levels of radiation that cause cause you any harm or or even harm the tumor, unfortunately. Um, But it's certainly enough that it shows up on this very sensitive equipment. So the reason I'm telling you this is because... If you have glucose in your body, and if it is near a tumor, it will feed the tumor. This is one of the reasons why people with cancer often go on low-sugar diets. It's one of the reasons why one of the experimental drugs for treating cancerous tumors is metformin, the the anti-diabetes drug. Metformin basically mops up all the sugar in your body. So if you give someone metformin, and then you take their blood and you test for glucose, you'll find low levels even if they've been eating sugar. Metformin is kind of a 
a sugar lowering drug. And they found that when people take metformin, they have lower rates of cancer. This is relevant because if you are bathing your body, whether it's your brain through a cell phone, whether it's your whole body by sleeping next to a Wi-Fi router or sleeping next to your cell phone while it charges or sleeping next to a smart meter, regardless of your source of electromagnetic radiation, maybe you're sleeping uh, right next to a cell tower. If you're bombarding your body with this energy, your body is going to be putting glucose to the area that's, that, that, that the radiation is hitting. So in my case, that was my brain. In a man's case, if a man holds a phone up to his genitalia, he will be much more likely to not only have a lower sperm count, that's, that's a result of the heating effect, but also to develop cancer in those regions. And one of the shocking things, I'm a breast cancer survivor, that's why I got tumors in my brain. They were breast cancer, unfortunately, stage four breast cancer tumors. But in, in the case of women, breast cancer has always been a disease that impacted older women. You know, women in their 60s, 70s, 80s. It was considered a disease of late life. And it was a rare situation in which a woman in her 40s might develop cancer and extremely rare, rare when a woman in her 30s would develop breast cancer, almost unheard of. Well, lately, we've been hearing from oncologists that there's a rash, and an absolute epidemic of breast cancer in women in their 20s and even in their teens. And what's shocking about these cancers and what's very telling is that the cancers occur in women who tuck their phones into their bras. And now you might say, well, why in the world would you do that? Well, you men probably don't realize this, but women's clothing often doesn't have pockets. It's one of the frustrating things about being a woman. If you have a dress, it won't have a pocket. If you wear workout clothes, they don't have pockets. So if you want to be talking on your cell phone and, say, jogging or working out or on the Stairmaster or whatever you're doing, even if you're just on the cell phone, say, uh, looking at your Facebook account, you're still bringing um, signals into that phone. And if you're going to be doing that, then you don't have a place to put the phone. Where are you going to put it? You're going to tuck it in your bra because it's the one place where you've got kind of a, a, a stretchy place where it's not going to fall. If you put it in your waistband, I know because I've done this, put things in my waistband, they'll fall right down to the floor. They'll, they'll, they'll fall through and wind up on, you know, on the floor yeah. at the bottom of your pants. If you put them in your bra, they can't go down because your breasts are there. Mm. So it's actually a reasonable place. I know this is kind of weird, but it's a reasonable place to tuck a thing. You've often seen probably in the movies where women will reach into their bra and pull out a $20 bill. And you're like, well, why would she keep a $20 bill in her bra? The answer is because she doesn't have a pocket. So women out there listening to this broadcast, Irish women, I want you never, ever, under any circumstances to ever put a phone in your bra. Never buy, a, heaven forbid, a smart bra. There are actually bras out there. Talk about a nightmare from a cancer perspective. There are bras that actually have a Fitbit embedded in the bra. It's an electromagnetic radiating sensor in the bra. And that's like the dumbest place you could ever, ever think to put an energetic, an energy emitting, radio emitting device. So don't put your phone in your bra. And what I was going to tell you is that these women in their 20s are developing breast cancer, deadly, fast growing breast cancers. And they're developing it precisely in the location on their breast where the antenna of their phone was kept when they went jogging or they went out exercising. Almost all of these women were frequent exercisers, and that's, you know, doctors will tell you that's the group with the lowest likelihood of developing cancer, but that's also the group with the highest likelihood of tucking their phones into their bras because it's workout clothes, particularly that don't have pockets. So, why is this a problem? It's a problem because the cell phone radiation is drawing glucose into the area. And at the same time, it's also emitting a form of radiation. It's not nuclear radiation, but it's electromagnetic radiation into the cellular tissue. And we know, based on my research um, of microchip implants, when you put an implant into a body, whether it's uh, the body of a dog or a cat, um, so that they can be found, you know, those microchip ID implants that they yeah. put, whether it's an implant that you put in the body for other reasons, if that implant is picking up and magnifying ambient electromagnetic radiation, it's causing cancer in a certain percentage of cases. So that's not only the glucose, that's also just 
the radiation itself. It's modifying the tissue. We know from research out of um, the, the European Union that was done a number of years ago that there actually is DNA damage that occurs, that exposure to excessive electromagnetic radiation actually unzips the DNA in cells. And what's even more disturbing about this, it doesn't just damage the cells, it actually modifies their DNA, and then the cells continue to live and they divide. And the the offspring cells, you know, a cell divides into two and then four and then eight, they all contain the genetic mutation. So there are so many reasons I can talk about from a health perspective why you do not want to expose yourself to this. Now, one other thing people should know, it's not just Wi-Fi devices smart meters, and phones. It's even pencil sharpeners and cordless phone base stations. Now, what am I talking about? When You can actually buy an electric meter, an electronic um, uh, emission meter. You can carry it around your house, and you can hold it up to various things, and you can see what's emitting the maximum amount of energy. And even if it's just an electrical current, those all fall somewhere on the electromagnetic spectrum. They're on the lower level of the spectrum, but they're all interrelated. We know from research that was done in the 1970s and 80s that you never want to sleep under an electric blanket, for example, because the electric blanket is plugged into the wall, and it's got running through it back and forth, crisscrossing a whole bunch of wires that is what heats it up, but those wires are basically covering your entire body in low frequency electromagnetic radiation from the power lines. So you don't want to do that. If you if you own an electric blanket, don't throw it out. Turn it on on a cold night. Let it run for half an hour till the, the bed is nice and toasty. Don't just turn it off, but actually unplug it and now climb in. And then your body heat will provide the residual heat after that. So where is it that we're getting this kind of exposure? We're getting it by living under power lines. There's actually a, an amazing video you can see online where there's an artist and he takes fluorescent light bulbs, you know, the long tubes, glass tubes with um, neon inside or yeah. whatever they contain. And he actually goes out under power lines and they light up. And he's made entire exhibitions, exhibits, where he'll take 500 of these things and he'll put them in all sorts of patterns and they light up without even being plugged in simply because of the energy that's being emitted by the power lines. So if you're living under a power line and you're having health problems, you may want to consider moving. I think so. You know, if 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 you are now there's ways that we can protect ourselves even in our homes. So I was talking about these meters that you can go around with and you can actually aim them at different appliances and see where the problems are. I have a friend who bought one of these things online. It was like a hundred bucks. And he went around his house and shockingly he found that the worst offender in his entire home was the pencil sharpener. And the pencil sharpener was like spiking almost off the chart. It almost spiked this thing to the very top of its meter sensitivity. And the weird thing is it was doing this even when it wasn't being used. when It was, it was just plugged in, but he wasn't sharpening any pencils. And what he discovered is that when you have a pencil sharpener and you plug it in, you know the big, the, the, the big heavy kind that can really sharpen a pencil quickly? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that in standby mode, their motor is emitting tons of energy. And so what he figured out, he actually put it in... I'm going to look at the brand. Hang on one second. I'm going to look. I'm going to have to switch off my pencil sharpener, I think. Yeah, so have I Have you got one? Yeah, <laughs> it's the electric one. product I oh. love, and I don't know if you guys sell products, but you should, you should stock these. It's called Belkin, B-E-L-K-I-N. And what it is, is it's a little... Mm, you know how you can turn one plug into three plugs with like a little thing you plug into the wall and yeah. it has like three plugs on it? All right, yeah. it's kind of like that, except it plugs in and it's only got one plug on it. So basically you go from one plug to one plug, except it has an on-off switch on the side. And I have one right here hooked up to my radio equipment. I love it. And what I do is my, my radio equipment's actually noisy. <laughs> I don't like the noise. So when my show is over, I flip it off. And this way I don't have to turn off the whole equipment. I can turn off the power to the equipment. And so these little Belkin switches are the greatest thing I've ever found. What you want to do is take one and plug it into the plug where your um, pencil sharpener plugs into the wall. And when you're not using the pencil sharpener, turn it off. And you're actually turning the power off. You can, you can do this on your electric blanket like I was just talking about instead of unplugging it. 
And I should point out the other massive, potentially deadly source of this energy is hospital beds. I'm sure there are people listening who have a convalescing a older person or a, an ill person in their homes and you can spend like a thousand euros and you can buy um, or do you have British pounds in Ireland? What do you have there? We have euro. You have euros. All right. So maybe 500 euros. You can buy an electric bed that will help your loved one go from a lying down to a sitting up position or even to a standing position. They're expensive beds. You see them in hospitals. Here's the problem with them. When they're not being used, when you're not actively moving them around, they're emitting immense amounts of energy, just like the pencil sharpener. And so my friend was saying, my pencil sharpener was sitting right on my desk within two feet of of my reproductive organs. That's got to be incredibly bad for you. The hospital bed is bathing the people in our society who most need to be protected. It's bathing them in some of the most unhealthy energy around anywhere and it's not just like a pencil sharpener where it's getting part of you but this is covering your whole body so it's like getting under an electric blanket but it's underneath the person Mm. so if you have a hospital bed in your home and i have family members who actually i have a family member who actually does then you want to get one of these little belkin switches and when they're not moving the bed which is 99.99 percent of the time turn the darn thing off and when i say turn it off don't just turn it off like, cut the power to it. And this is why I love these switches. It cuts the power. So if you have an appliance you think is spying on you, put in one of these little Belkin switches. There's probably other brands, too, but I love mine. And it will cut the power so that the appliance can't be remotely turned on and used to spy on you because there's no way to bypass the power cut. So there are, um, I was going to tell you, the other source of this kind of radiation that's really unhealthy, the base station of your cordless phone. Mm. All of my phones are corded. I don't have a cordless phone. I don't, I don't like the notion of cordless phones, so I don't have one. But most people do, and you know, that's okay. But you want to make sure the base station, not the phone itself, but the base station is far, far away from people. Not around children, not around your sleeping area, not in the office where you work, not in your kitchen where you're spending lots of time preparing food, not in your dining room where you're eating. You want it to be like in the garage. <laughs> like, Really far away, like in the basement, yeah. like in some far distant, dusty corner that nobody goes to. Because that's the other thing that you can take one of these meters, and if you want to see it go off the chart and go nuts, aim it at your pencil sharpener, your electric bed, your electric blanket, or aim it at the base station of your cordless phone. So keep those away from you. Now, that's the low-level electromagnetic radiation. And the other source of it in almost everybody's life is the alarm clock next to your bed. You've got, a, you've got an alarm plugged in, in most cases, you know, a foot from your head. Ter- terrible idea, because that's emitting energy, too. So all of these things, get them away from you. You know, human beings did not, um, were not created, did not evolve, however you want to describe it, to, to be exposed to these kind of energy forces, energy fields. We, they never existed before. So you've got to make sure that you're giving your body as much purification as possible. People drink purified water, they eat organic food, and then they surround themselves with these other completely horrifying health hazards. I think, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've been on the road with the deck phones. Myself and Steve have wired phones, got rid of the microwave, and um, our, our computers are all hardwired as well. We don't have Wi-Fi on. But tell me, Catherine, what do you think is behind all this? What's the sinister motives of the elite with the uh, smart meters, the smart grid? We have water meters over here that are wireless um, and everything else. What's, what do you think the master plan is? What, do, what are they trying to do to us? Well, we just had a congressional hearing in which the director of intelligence and national security in the U.S. actually came out and said, I mean, specifically said point blank, we believe, we know, that all of these smart appliances that people are putting in their homes, the Internet of Things, can be used to obtain intelligence against them. They came right out and said it. So it's it's pretty obvious. Uh, It it doesn't really take them admitting it to know that it's going to happen, but it's particularly helpful when they come right out and just tell you. So what is the problem? I've, I've 
I have a phrase that I use to, to describe this, and I call it 20th century, 21st century tyranny as opposed to 20th century tyranny. Mm. And as I may have discussed, as I've discussed many times, in the 20th century, when Stalin, who took over the Soviet Union and killed 60 million people who were his political opponents, when he wanted to know what people were thinking or doing, he had to create an entire nationwide network of, of informants. And it was very expensive to do. He had to pay these people. He had to create all kinds of infiltration to be able to figure out who were his opponents and who was on his side. In the 20th century, oppression, political oppression, meant storm boots, stormtroopers. It meant simply saying, jackboots, if, if you don't do what I say, I'll kill you. And I'll kill your family, too. <laughs> I'll drop a bomb on you. Mm. You will be dead. I'll send soldiers over to disappear you in the night. That's 20th century tyranny. There's only a pro- one problem with it. Under that form of tyranny, when people know they're being tyrannized, they hate you. And they look for any crack in your armor and any opportunity to take you down. So you're always looking over your shoulder in a regime like that. You may think you have the power, but the minute your back is turned, somebody's going to assassinate you. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to break your system. Some all, People are always looking for ways to sabotage you. So what has happened in the 21st century is that the insights of psychology and the lies of mass media has made it possible to come up with a brand new form of tyranny that absolutely eclipses what was happening in the 20th century. And the new form of tyranny is one that says, rather than intimidate people into doing what we want, we can convince them to embrace the things that we want them to embrace. Rather than send jackbooted thugs to install surveillance cameras in people's homes and to have to intimidate them at the point of a gun to maintain those, we can instead get people to not only install the cameras in their homes, but to pay us hundreds of dollars for the privilege and then thank us and write wonderful things about how great we are. So this is the difference. What has been figured out in the last hundred years, and it's really important that people understand this, I'd say even in the last 40 years, 50 years, What has been figured out is how to manipulate people emotionally and psychologically to where instead of opposing the things that are bad for them, they actually long for the things that are bad for them. Instead of running away from things that would harm them, they actually run towards them and buy them and pay for them and pride themselves on owning them. So this is why you see people installing drop cams in their homes This is why you will see people buying the new Samsung Smart Hub refrigerator, which spies on you. This is why you'll see people buying light bulbs with microphones in them. And you may ask, well, why the heck would you do that? Well, so you could simply say, hey, light, turn up. Hey, light, turn off. And the light will respond to you. Mm. But, of course, the light is now listening to everything you say and reporting all that back to marketers and hackers and government agents. So you basically... Instead of having the jackboots demand that you install the surveillance equipment in your home, like happened in the book 1984, where Winston was required by law to have a two-way television that watched him, instead you get people to voluntarily take these things. And I'd say between 80 and 90% of people are, I don't want to say dumb, because they're not. They're manipulated to fall victim to this. And they look at the 10% of us who say, I don't want it, and they say, ha ha, you guys are out to lunch. You're dinosaurs. You don't get it. You're conspiracy theorists. You're whatever. And because the media is so sophisticated, it's able to even further that viewpoint. I don't know if you guys get uh, an NPR program. You probably don't. Called Prairie Home Companion. It's a big U.S. thing with Garrison Keillor as this very down home country guy. And he tells all these homespun stories and he has music and it's humor and it's fun and it's on every weekend on national public radio i stopped listening to it a couple of years ago because garrison keeler of all people was doing a skit where he was making fun of some brother-in-law who believed that 9-11 was an inside job and if you've done any research on 9-11 at all you know that there are so many discrepancies and holes in the story that the American people were told about that. And that was used as an excuse to usher in so many levels of government tyranny. It's not even funny. But Garrison Keillor was basically saying, ha ha, you know the guy. Oh yeah, he's, you know, it's Joe again or whatever. I don't even remember the skit at this point. I'd have to look it up. But he was totally teaching his listening audience how to make fun 
of people who raise these issues. So it was basically, this is what all of the media has become now. It's training. It mm. teaches people who don't think deeply how to respond when somebody tries to tell them, hey, there's a real problem going on. Oh, yeah, you're one of those conspiracy theorists, you know. Oh, yeah, let's, you know, move over. Here he comes. It teaches you. And when I heard this, it was so obviously, I mean, I've got a doctorate in education and, and in human development and psychology. So I understand what psychological manipulation is, and I understand what education is. And when I turn on the TV, which I don't watch anymore, I don't, I don't watch mainstream TV, I don't listen to mainstream music, I've turned myself off to most of what Hollywood puts out because I can see right through it that it is a, a, a medium a means through which this manipulation of 90% of the population is taking place. And it terrifies me. It's uh, definitely worrying. With the the, the, um, the the fact that we have um, so much electronic smog out there, do you feel that, uh, Steve has a question as well, do you feel that, um, that there's more sinister things going on? I mean, with the fact that there's been a massive increase in cancers over the years, and tumours, and you know, even though people have reduced their smoking, a lot of people have given up smoking, and and, and they don't smoke anymore. But yet, over the years, since the seventies, there has been a massive increase in tumours and uh, certain types of cancers. And a lot of people will put it down to the electronic smog that's out there, the environment that we're in, obviously poisons in our food. Do you think does an an ultimate kind of aim of the elite? to, you know, uh, for, say, a eugenics program to depopulate the, the planet in some way? I don't think it's coming through electromagnetic smog, but I do believe that there is such a plan. And it's something I rarely talk about, and I rarely get an opportunity to talk about. But you mentioned something earlier, which I want to expand upon. And this is the study that was out in the UK Telegraph. It was done by uh, a British university, in which they found that at an infertility clinic, people who put their cell phones in their, men who put their cell phones in their pants pockets were developing severe sperm production, sperm motility problems that were leading to infertility. Now, I want to expand that a little bit because let us say, hypothetically, and I always like to say conspiracy things as though they were a movie plot because I think it gets easier to talk about. If you had a movie plot in which powerful people wanted to reduce the population of the planet Earth by simply weeding out the undesirables, then the best way to go about doing that would not be to make them all get cancer, because that's going to cost you a lot of money. That's a public health issue, and you're going to have to provide for them through hospitals and Medicare and all sorts of things. So you probably wouldn't want to do that. That might be a side effect, but it probably wouldn't be your first goal. The way to reduce undesirable populations is to render them infertile. And you can do this through a number of means, and some of them scare the daylights out of me. And I'd like to do a whole hour on this. I'm looking at the time. We're going to run out of time. But let me see if I can get started. The number one reducer of fertility and reducer of male hormones in the human body is soy. Soy. Soy is such a potent and powerful estrogenic that... It has never been used by any culture as a staple food. I know a lot of people say Asians eat soy, and I would say to that, Asians eat soy as a condiment, kind of like we eat mustard as a condiment. They don't eat it as a staple like we would eat hamburger. And when they do eat soy in any quantity at all, they ferment it, which takes the estrogenic toxins out of it. So soy sauce, fermented tempeh, fermented um, natto, which is really disgusting, but it's fermented soy, all of those have their estrogen toxins reduced because they are um, basically when you ferment soy, you take those toxins out. Now, soy has never been used as animal feed because in the past, farmers knew, and they, they even know today, that if you feed animals soy, they will become infertile. They will be incapable of reproducing. And so if you feed your herd soy, they might do great in this generation, but they won't have any offspring and you won't have another generation. So what happened in the 1970s is a guy named Dwayne Andreas, you can look him up, he's called the Soybean King. He is listed on Wikipedia as being the number one political donor in all of history. And what Dwayne Andreas did, he's the, he was the chairman of the board of the Archer Daniels Midland Company, which is the big agri, 
um, business, agri corporation, that provides all of these agricultural products to the world. They call themselves, quote, supermarket to the world. And in the 1970s, Duane Andreas had a single-minded vision. And his single-minded vision, based on all of his hobnobbing with the wealthy and the important, both in the Democratic and Republican parties, and the extraordinarily wealthy elite who rule the planet, his vision was to take the lowly soybean, which nobody would eat, which was used at that time for making paint as an industrial uh, product, and turn it into foodstuffs for, for humans. So he traveled behind the Iron Curtain. Back then we had an Iron Curtain. He traveled to South America. He traveled to virtually every country on the globe. And he opened the doors through political contributions for soybean oil to become the predominant oil on planet Earth. Prior to the 1970s, you couldn't find soybean oil even if you tried, unless you found it as an industrial product that was used for, I don't know, you know, uh, oiling watches or something. But you certainly couldn't find it as food. When I was growing up in the 1970s, when we talked about, quote, vegetable oil, it was always corn oil. And it wasn't genetically modified because they didn't have that ability. So I grew up on corn oil. Everybody in my generation and before grew up on corn oil. And then in the 1970s, Duane Andreas began introducing soybean oil. Now, why is this important? Because it was followed by the next move of the, the giant corporations and the elite, which was to promote soy not only as not toxic, but as good for you. And so this is how we got soy milk, soy protein, isolate, uh, inserted into virtually every cheap food that's out there. And if you go into your supermarket, you'll find the expensive food never contains soy, and the cheap food always contains soy. My husband and I once found a brand of peanut butter here in the U.S. If you bought it in small containers, like you'd buy if you were a single person or maybe a couple, it contained no soy. But if you bought the mega container, which you would buy if you had a family, say, of eight, then it, it was filled, jam-packed with soy. Soy protein, soybean oil, soy everything. So what does this mean? It means that the elite don't eat soy, but they feed it to the poor. And the reason they feed it to the poor is it makes people infertile. And the way it does that is very scary. It mm-hmm. makes men infertile by feminizing them. Men begin to grow breasts. They stop growing beards. Their entire hormonal system shifts. Their sperm count reduces by as much as half or even 60%. And what's more interesting still, they no longer have an interest in mating with women. If you give enough soy to an animal or to a human, it will no longer, if it's male, it will no longer have the normal sexual drive that is instinctive, that people can't control, that just drives them to want to find a mate. Ah, that's and, what the problem is then. Yes. It's the soy. Yes. <laughs> so what has it done? It's not only made people physically infertile by not having the, the proper amount of sperm to even impregnate a woman, but it's caused people mentally and emotionally coupled with all kinds of manipulation from the media and the mainstream, coupled with this, you don't have to be male, you could be neutral, you could be female, you could be whatever you want. You don't need to find a woman and get married and have children. You can find a man and get married and not have children. You can decide to just lop your parts off and become neutral. Okay, so, uh, just a question then. Does that soy affect the women as well? It does. And what it does in women is even scarier. In women, uh, at least for me, in women it causes cancer. In women it causes breast cancer, reproductive cancers. It causes uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, it affects all of the sexual organs. So in men, if you douse men with estrogen, they become, I don't know, Caitlyn Jenner. If you douse women in estrogen, they become me. And the reason I say me is I have stage 4 breast cancer and I have thyroid disease. My thyroid was blown out. Soy in excessive quantities blows out your thyroid. And what does that do? It makes you fat. It makes you slow. It makes you not want to fight back against the powers that be. And so in women, there is an epidemic in women in middle age developing thyroid problems. Huge. Virtually every woman I know is on thyroid supplements because we've all destroyed our thyroids. And I, like an idiot in my 20s, decided to become a complete vegetarian and live on soy. So for 15 years, all I did was eat soy. Soy burgers, soy sausages, soy bacon, you name it, soy milk. I sucked it down. And I destroyed my, my thyroid. 
I lost two thirds of my hair. I gained 45 pounds. I developed breast cancer. Um, basically, it's, it's costing me my life. So with women, it causes cancer. With men, it contributes to um, testicular cancer, prostate cancer. But I think more importantly in men, it causes them to have no sexual identity. And then the culture steps in and says, okay, through the mainstream media, the Oscars, the Grammys, the you name it, the music, the movies, the TV, it says, you don't need a gender. Pick your own gender. Choose your own gender because they know that people are no longer driven by their hormones to a predetermined gender. See, when, when men turn, I don't know, when boys turn 11, 12, 13, and they start thinking about girls, they didn't plan that. That The hormones drive that. The reason that 12-year-old boys start thinking girls are cute is not because they decide that. It's because the hormones drive it. But what if the hormones aren't there? And now what, you're, 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 you're reaching a point where you're maybe going to have an interest in those kind of activities, but no, nothing's driving you to say, a woman is who I want. And so what does the culture say? You choose. You decide. You pick. You want a man? Go ahead. You want your best friend? Fine. Because there's nothing driving you physiologically to that outcome. And so when now let me get back to your original question. Is there a move afoot to reduce our population? Well, I don't know. If men are hooking up with men and women are hooking up with women, and people are lopping off their sexual organs, physically removing them from their bodies, you're going to have a lot less people. True. It's um, it's 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 worrying to a certain extent, and I know I'm just watching the time there, and I know that we're we've lived the time with you, Catherine. I think we found our part three for our next interview. But Steve has a question there. He wants to. He has two questions there. He wants to ask it yeah. before we uh, we finish up. Yeah, Catherine. Um, one I already had in relation to the smart stuff, and then the second one uh, when you're talking about the soy, and if someone is using soy milk, um. And well, now that we're aware of the dangers, is there any other milk that you could recommend? I mean, obviously, I'm not, I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, really, anything else? Coconut milk, almond milk, cashew milk, rice milk. Yeah. Anything but soy. Anything. Yeah. Anything but soy. And let me tell you that soy is in everything. Yeah. And it's not a mistake. But when you go into the congressional dining hall, which Nancy Pelosi has completely redone, you won't find a speck of soy in that place. When John Kerry, whose wife is Teresa Heinz Carey, who runs all of the mayonnaise and the, and the everything that goes out to all the, the fast food restaurants. When they went into a Wendy's restaurant, which is a fast food restaurant with really cheap food packed with soy, do you know that John Kerry, even though he was doing a media appearance in the Wendy's, even though 50 TV cameras were focused on him, he refused to take a bite out of the food? Wow. Not one bite went into his mouth. Not one French fry cooked in soybean oil. Not one burger with soy filler in it, not one bit of that bun which has soy flour in it, he didn't touch it. Wow. That speaks yeah. volumes, really, doesn't it? It does doesn't indeed. It. Do you, you even know yeah, and just, just the, the, the last question I have, Catherine, is um, when, when kind of the smart technology starts to roll in and uh, people are going to start embracing this technology and you have people like yourself and ourselves here and all the other people who know exactly where, kind of, where... It's going. Uh, when we kind of refuse that technology, the, do you reckon because we're going to be in the where, where, uh, the, uh, the minority, um, at some point in time, do you reckon maybe laws will be passed to say we have to have that technology or will, will we be left I actually, alone? I actually have a, a, a Albrecht's Law. <laughs> yeah. I kind of created my own law. One of my listeners said, I'm going to call that Albrecht's Law. And basically, once you have 85% of the public doing anything voluntarily, the other 15% will be forced to do it through law. So when you first introduce something, and I'll use an example of toll passes, which we've got toll roads in the U.S., which you used to just drive by, roll down your window, and hand a buck to the toll, toll person. Nowadays, people have to put transponders on their cars for certain highways, and those transponders don't just track you through the tolls with radio frequency ID. They're RFID tracking devices. They track you any place they want to put a reader. So... How did they make people comply with that? Well, initially it was voluntary. until, And then they convinced everybody how great it was and how convenient and how awesome. And they used all the manipulation, all the psychology I've talked about. And as soon as 85% of people got on board, they began making it mandatory for the other 15. So this is what's going to happen with everything. 
Once 85% of people get on board with it, then they'll say, you hold out, get with the times. And the majority of people will support them making a law. So that's, that's kind of how the whole system works. You find something, you try to make it seem sexy, cool, and amazing. And, you know, let me, let me give you just one more quick example. 23andMe, which is the DNA company that was founded by the um, then wife of one of the Google founders. It is a company where for 200 bucks, you can spit into a vial and send them your DNA. All right, now think about under Stalin, what it would have taken to get jackbooted thugs to force you to spit into that cup to give your most prized possession, your most personal information, which is your DNA, to them. But this company actually gets you to pay 200 bucks for the privilege of doing it. And they've already been sharing that information with health researchers. They've already been handing people's DNA over without their permission. Now, they say, well, we don't provide any identifying information. I have to laugh. What is more identifying of you than your DNA? Mm. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the most unique thing you'll ever have in a million years. It is you. It, it, in it, fact, with it, they could clone you. They could make a baby you. It's, it's, like, um, it's like George Orwell on steroids, isn't it? It is. It is. And so what will happen is once they convince enough people to pay 200 bucks for it, then they're going to say, we need everybody's DNA. Yeah. We know them. It, and they'll use an excuse, just like the, the FBI is now using with Apple, hand over the, the, you know, allow us to backdoor into the encryption. They're going to say the same thing. Uh, with those 15% holdouts, they're all criminals and terrorists. They just don't want to get their DNA. So we got to pass a law and make them. And everybody else is going to go, hoo yeah, yeah, do it, do it, get them. Yeah. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? I'll tell you, we could talk for another hour on the information that you have because the information has been fantastic. And I know we're, you're very busy and we have limited time, but what we've talked about there and what we've covered, not just the smart meters, but everything there, especially with the SIA, very, very important for our listeners to get on board and to obviously do their own research. But definitely uh, we know about the smart meters in Ireland. But again, a big thank you, Catherine, for taking the time out to come on to OAM and to you know help us pass on that information to our listeners because people need to wake up, need to, you know, to get with it, because if they don't, then it's going to start becoming compulsory, and we don't want that. But a big, a big thank you for coming on. I'm going to pass you off to Steve. Steve's going to get all your details so uh, people know where to find you. Steve. All right, terrific. Thank you so much, and I'm going to refer people to my book, I Won't Take the Mark, because all this is spiritual, and that's at virtuepress.com. And if you want to get private encrypted email, that's at startmail.com. I help create it. And if you use the promo code KMA, you'll get five bucks off. So I want everybody to be private and stay safe. Thank you. God bless you both. And don't forget as well, start page as your browser. Uh, it's I, free. Search it, engine. It's free. It's your free. search engine. Yeah, I've been using that now since uh, the last conversation we had. Actually, before the last conversation we had. So I urge people to check that out as well. Because obviously, the more people that use it, the better it gets. Great. Good for you. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. Okay, Catherine, just stay with us there and we'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com, and PeoplesInternetRadio.com. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. We had a server crash. And, you know, things like this happen when we have a guest that's coming on that's going to be talking about something that's controversial. And the powers to be don't want this information getting out there. We tend to have these little slip-ups. And, um, well, hmm, is it technical or is it something else more sinister? We don't know. Okay, well, we have our guest on. Now, we only have a, a few minutes with our guest because he's a very busy man. Um, and our guest is called David Noakes. And we're going to be talking about GC Math. And we've mentioned this before. We've had Dr. Rima on the show and we've mentioned GC Math before. And as you probably know, there's 21 doctors around the world that have been killed uh, because of um, they've been talking and exposing the benefits of GC Math and what's been going on, and uh, David as well has been persecuted by the authorities where he lives and um, has gone through so many things and hassle by the authorities because they don't want this information getting out there. And this is why we didn't ne- we didn't put David's name on the schedule. Um, because we just wanted to keep it quiet until David came on. So without further ado, we'll bring David on. Good evening, David. How are you? Yep, I'm pretty good. How are you? Not too bad. Listen, thanks a lot for coming on. I know you're up against it at the moment, so we appreciate if we can get about 20, 25 minutes off you. Just to kind of tell us about GC Math, what's going on, 
why you've been persecuted and how people can get their hands on, on GC Math because we know you produce it and you, you can actually provide it to them. But certainly give us your, your background and give us um, the story of GC Math and how you got involved. Okay, well, GC Math is a human protein and it is the best treatment known for uh, all tumor cancers, which is 90% of cancers. And um, it's, uh, it also treats 50 other diseases successfully. Uh, hepatitis B and C, for example, cirrhosis, colitis. We've treated 10,000 patients around the world, so we know exactly what it does. Right, okay. Fantastic. And um, t- tell us why they don't, they don't want us knowing about this, and why there's been 21 doctors around the world killed because of it. Big Pharma makes about a trillion dollars a year by selling stunningly expensive um, drugs. Um, as a human protein, GCMAF has no side effects, and it is very inexpensive. You're talking an average of 40,000 pounds for a round of chemotherapy, whereas a round of GCMAF is about 450 euros. So they don't like the fact that it's very successful. So in our clinic, 77% of terminal stage 4 cancer patients get a tumor reduction of just of 25% in just one week. And they can't match that with chemotherapy or any other drugs. Chemotherapy is, of course, is a poison that mains and kills. And they are desperate to protect it for as long as they can because they make about $200 billion a year just out of chemotherapy. So they spend about a billion a year, one billion a year, on changing the laws in Western nations so that only their product, the poison of chemotherapy, is allowed to be treated, for, uh, allowed to be used for cancer. And they also have a whole raft of so-called charities, um, uh, websites, journalists, media outlets, to spread disinformation. So, for example, the Wikipedia entry for GC Mass, if you try to post there the 120 research papers written by 200 scientists on GC Mass, within a few minutes of you putting it up there, it's taken down by disinformation specialists who are paid by the big pharmaceutical companies to watch a number of wiki entries that they don't like and take them down when they say something they that's good for that particular treatment. Now, I, I was down at the seminar you did down in Dingle. It was very good. And what you said on the seminar was that we naturally produce GC math, but it gets switched off in our body. Um, and I think it was in reference to the vaccines that could be causing it. Is that correct? No, no, no. What happens is um, all human beings make GC math. Right. Um, but there are a number of diseases, 50 that we know of, and all cancers that prevent production of GC mass in your body if they get a chance to take a hold. And they can get a chance if you become weak or you get pneumonia or you go through a bad time. That gives the, the, um, the disease a chance to send out an enzyme called, um, uh, gosh, I can't remember the name of it now, uh, Nagalase, which prevents production of your body's own GC mass. And then the disease becomes chronic and you can't get rid of it. If it's cancer, you're dead in five years. So, um, uh, but if you administer uh, GC mass uh, as a treatment, the naglase can't touch it. It can only touch the thing that makes GC mass in the first place, this precursor, uh, which is GC protein. It can't actually attack GC mass. Okay, so where does the, the idea of the vaccines, because from our research we've heard that the vaccines are, are actually cause um, or create the nagalase that switch, switches off the GC math. Is that correct? So nagalase is a very dangerous substance. And um, Dr. Bradstreet and a number of other people suspect, were suspecting that they are putting nagalase into... Um, vaccines to store up profits for the future. So the idea is that then you 
you're given a vaccine which puts the maglase inside you, which stops your own GC mass. It's only a matter of time before you have a disease, and then they can sell you drugs to cure that disease, except they probably won't cure it. That's that's incredible, and this is what we heard as well. Now, you've been persecuted by the authorities where you are. Do you want to tell us what you've been through? Because it's quite horrendous. Well, it started off with the MHRA. Now, the, the MHRA are a British regulator, and they're supposed to act as the British people. But actually, they've got big pharma directors on the board, and what they actually do is protect the profits of the big pharmaceutical companies and close down any promising treatment gets in their way. Well, of course, GC Math is a promising treatment, and we were making it, so they closed down um, our laboratory in Cambridge, and then they closed down the bank accounts of our company, Immunobiotech. It hasn't traded for a year now. And they closed down my bank accounts and the bank accounts of five of our staff. So they left six people absolutely penniless. Now, they've, they've also locked down your, your bank accounts. And I know you had a visit from um, at your office for a 12-hour 12 12 period, I believe you were talking about. Well, actually, the second thing they did was they tipped off the Swiss authorities, and we had a, a clinic in Lausanne in Switzerland, and this is the first clinic in which we were um, giving 77% of terminal stage 4 cancer patients a 25% tumor reduction in one week and sending them home recovering instead of dying. That, of course, is a crime. In the medical world, it is a crime to cure people. You are allowed to kill, but you're not allowed to cure. So 10 police arrived, as they always do. 10 police arrived at our, cl at our laboratory, but 10 police arrived at our clinic, closed the clinic down, threw all the patients out into the street, and closed the Swiss bank, bank accounts down of the Swiss company that was running our Swiss clinic. So that was the second thing that happened, and some of those staff who were interrogated for 10 hours, are so traumatized. Now, that was two, two female doctors and two, and two female nurses were so traumatized that they couldn't work for six months afterwards. And then the third thing they did on the island of Guernsey, which is the most corrupt place I have ever lived, the courts are corrupt, the government's corrupt, they sent in 20 police for 12 hours. And their job was simply to look for our Guernsey laboratory. Well, why would we have a laboratory on Guernsey? You know, every vial of GC mass that moves on Guernsey is seized. And given it is also the most corrupt place we know, why would we ever have a lab in Guernsey? Yes, we have three laboratories, but none of them are on Guernsey. And after three minutes, the 20 police should have realized there wasn't a lab there. They should have apologized and withdrawn. But no. They went through every single item we possess. Every pair, of, every pair of knickers, every bra, every single item that we had in that house, they went right through. They took away 125 bags, uh, all our computers, 20 of them. And this is the island of Guernsey. It's not a place you want to go to. And um, uh, they also took away 7,000 sheets of paper none of which they were allowed to do under the terms of the search warrant, and um, uh, traumatized four more of our staff. So that was pretty horrible, but it's what you expect if you um, uh, get in the way of the big pharmaceutical companies. So what's the situation with you now, David, and your team? Are you still producing the GC mass steel? Can you still go ahead and, and, and walk on and, and produce it and supply it? We don't produce it ourselves. We've given we've given the formula to um, European laboratories who now make it. Okay, and you said they, they, you, that you go through a nine-stage process to get this. It's not something that you can just do offhand. You, you actually go through a nine-stage process to produce the proper GC math. No, we go through a 22-step process with oh. very excellent scientists. And after that, we put it through nine tests because it's very easy to make a fake GC mass. That is to say, inactive or dead GC mass. And in fact, most of the companies that have 
supply it, don't even attempt to make GC math. They vial liquid vitamin D or something else. So what, what do people need to do if they want to contact you, if they've been diagnosed with cancer and decide they don't want to go down the chemo route, what do they need mm. to do? Do they contact you? How does it work? Do, do, do they take it? Do you take it by needle? Do you take it orally? Uh, how does it work? Can you tell us how, you know, what we need to do? Well, first of all, you go to the gcmath.eu website and register uh, on the left-hand side, and, um, and then you contact us. You either call us or email us. And um, um, that's fairly easy to do, and then we advise you. Uh, there are four ways of getting it into the body, and um, each year we get better, not only with the product, uh, but also with our success in the clinics, which is why we have clinics, because we find improved protocols every few months. So uh, all the time we're getting better and better. Now, I have been asked, uh, David, and I'd like to, I'd like you to clarify this, that somebody did ask me, how is the GC math taken? You said there's four different ways it can be taken. Can you tell us what them four ways are? Yeah. Yeah. Initially, Dr. Yamamoto, PhD, who was one of the first of the 200 scientists who are now dealing with GC math, he would in- inject his patients with 0.25 ml. But you can now nebulize it, breathe it in, or use it as suppositories. We're coming up with a drinkable shortly. The problem with drinking it as it is, is once it gets into the stomach, the acids kill the protein. But we now have a method to get it past the stomach and into the liver. So we're going to be drinking it shortly. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Because we did get asked that. We asked, People are beginning to hear more about GC math and what, what can be done. Um, so people need to, we're going to get all your kind of details at the end. Is there anything that you'd like to uh, tell our listeners about GC Math, or anything that you've come across that they should know about, about GC Math? Well, we take pancreatic ca- cancer patients with, a, with two weeks to live, in, only in our clinics this is, and so far we've had 100% success with getting to the point in three months where they have no symptoms of the disease. Now, they've still got cancer, but in, in a bit over two years, we have just made our first one completely cancer-free. But the point is that with pancreatic cancer, at three months, you can go back to work. It's just that most of our patients are about 75 years old, so they generally go back to the golf course, not to work. Okay, and what about the likes of breast cancer, which is very common? Yes, we're very successful with breast cancer, prostate cancer, liver cancer, kidney cancer. Basically, GCMAS treats all tumor cancers successfully. Okay. Is there any other um, diseases out there that you would um, be able to use GCMAS for? I know you mentioned some at the start. Just go through them again. Sorry, go through what again? Uh, just the, the other diseases, the other um, symptoms that people suffer from. You Obviously, cancer being one of them, GCMAS can... And uh, obviously benefit people. Can you t- can you just go through that list again that you said? Um, well, if you go to the gcmath.eu website and go to treatment strategies, um, about the third thing down is the list of the 50 diseases and 33 tumor cancers we have treated successfully. Fantastic! I mean, that's uh, that's that's brilliant. And of course, you are aware. That 21 doctors have been killed for doing this. Are you not concerned about that yourself? Yes, but none of us know how to stop. I mean, how can you stop saving lives? Yeah. You know, we believe in honesty, truth, helping people. The big pharmaceutical companies believe in killing people, lies, and uh, fraudulent misrepresentation. The um, the MHRA in England committed fraudulent misrepresentation about our sterility, uh, made 18 fraudulent misrepresentations about our sterility on their website. They committed perjury to get a restraint order against us. So, you know, we are, pe- we are dealing with very dishonest people indeed, and the government of Guernsey has done exactly the same thing. It, 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 committed, it, yeah. committed perjury in misrepresentation. No, it is incredible. I mean, I have met you because I, I went down to the seminar and you were part, you were on the Pain Genie course with Richard and uh, you do have that drive and your wife as well um, to just go and heal people and even though there, there is a risk to yourself and your staff, as you say that 
you can't help it, but you have to go and, and do what needs to be done and, uh, and, you, and, and cure people. You, some <clears throat> people do what is right in this life, and some people really do what is wrong in this life and love it. There are people who love doing wrong. And Gerald Heddle, Gerald Heddle of the NHRA is one of those. And there are a number of judges in Guernsey who do wrong and love it. Right, okay. I mean, I, I totally agree. We have come across the system, and we, we know the uh, the system is corrupt, and they have their lobbyists out there with loads of uh, funding and, and, and money to, to back them up and, you know, obviously um, have a go with people like yourself. Um, what's the, uh, you're obviously saying, talking about new things that are happening with GC Maps, like take me never to take it in a drink. Um, what's a, for people who are interested in pursuing this more, can you give us a rough idea what the, the cost would be? So just, if it, you know, I don't want to, obviously, you know, different, different symptoms might create, you know, you, you might need to give different diagnosis to people, but a rough idea well, well, on costs. Well, if you've got something simple like sinusitis, one vial of GCMF of 450 euros will get rid of it. If you have terminal stage 4 cancer, um, it can take you a year, and you can spend six or 7,000 euros on it. Wow, okay. Well, mind you, that is a lot cheaper than um, chemotherapy, which is 40,000. Well, a lot of people spend a quarter of a million on chemotherapy and die. Yeah, yeah. Now, on a, as you say, you've had fan, fantastic success with this. If people want to contact you or people want to, um, do they have to go over to your clinic or do you send them out the, the GC map? How does it work? Well, they register, they call us, tell us how much they want, and we ship it. If they want to come to the clinic, that's something else. Obviously, the results we get in the clinic are better than you get at home. But uh, no, you can do it at home. Okay, we have a question, Steve. Yeah, um, David, just wondering, if people do register and they, they tell you um, what dose they require, and let's say it, they're, they're not in the UK, is there any issue with posting uh, of the GCMAF across the seas, like to say to Ireland or, or the, the United States? Well, we have um, one of our products registers as a completely legal supplement, which we can ship all over the world, let's say everywhere except Guernsey, because Guernsey ban anything we do, it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter whether it's how legal it is, they still ban it, because Guernsey breaks the law whenever the government wants to. Yeah. I th the only anywhere else in the world, we can ship anywhere else in the world. Yeah, the only reason I'm, I'm asking that question is because I went on earlier on to Wikipedia, you know, the, the, the source of information that everyone seems to, to, to use. And Wikipedia has a very, very short page on GCMAF. I was expecting to find a massive page. Uh, but they have a very, very small page. And just for the listeners, it actually says on Wikipedia, GCMAF has not been properly studied in clinical trials and its laboratory results still need to be confirmed independently. So far, all claims on the efficiency of this product have no solid scientific basis. Its marketing is illegal. Therefore, uh, there is no controlled guarantee on the quality of the product for human consumption sold over the Internet. Yeah, well, that site is controlled by Big Pharma. And Big Pharma pay disinformation specialists to stop people like me posting the truth onto that site. They say there's no scientific evidence. Excuse me, there are 200 scientists who've written 120 scientific research papers on GCMAS published in the world's top scientific journals. And we, my little company, Immunobiotech, has written 32 of those scientific research papers. But if you try and post them on that Wikipedia site in a few minutes, the disinformation specialists, who must be pretty evil people, have taken that down and put their own lies back up again. It's incredible, isn't it, how they just don't want to help to heal people, that they just, it's all for profit well, and money. Well, as they say, there's, 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 no, there's no money to be made by curing people. Exactly, yeah. They want uh, sick people. Well, David, we're not going to keep you. We know you're very busy and you're in the middle of things there. So I would just like to say a big thank you for coming on and sharing that information with us. Maybe down the line we'll do a, we'll do a full interview. 
Um, I'm going to pass you over to Steve. Steve's going to get all your contact details um, where people can contact you and find out about you. Steve. Yeah, uh, David, I know it's been a short interview, but some good information there, a lot of food for thought for people. We do have the website here, gcmath.eu, where people can go and check out. Is there any other links that you want to throw out there before you go? Um, well, if you want to do anything with GCMF, yes, go to gcmath.eu, um, fill in the registration form, and then telephone or email us, and um, that's all there is to it. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, David, well, listen... We're going to um, we're going to let you go because I know you're very busy. Just stay with us there for a minute, and we're just going to quickly go off to your musical break, and we'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com, and PeoplesInternetRadio.com. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh. A little bit late pressing the button there. Yeah, we're back. Uh, good information there from David Noakes. Uh, unfortunately, as I say, it was a very short interview because we were kind of limited to time with the Catherine Albrecht interview as well. But uh, David has agreed to come on and do a full interview. So we're going to try and pencil that in for a future date. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, we, we did want to kind of put out the David's name there because we knew there would be probably more attacks um, because we were going to be talking about GC Math. And um, as it happens, <laughs> our system goes down and we had to have a server reboot. So it'll all come out in the wash when we do the edit anyway. Now, we did say that we're going to do our, talk about a few bits and pieces and Alan and Steve's week at the end. And there's a few things that have happened during the week that we want to kind of talk about. And Steve's going to kick us off with um, the first thing on their list. The first thing, not the second thing, yeah. the first thing. Okay, uh, we've listened to a number of financial experts talking about the financial collapse and they recommend that people go and buy gold and silver. Obviously, they don't realise that people who are lucky, people are, are lucky enough to have food on the table, you know, let alone go out and buy gold or silver. Uh, unfortunately, some of these financial experts, they're not living in the real, well, they are living in the real world, but just their version of it, you know, where they have a few quid obviously stashed away in a little bank account somewhere and they can afford to buy gold and silver. Unfortunately, the regular, the regular Joe or the regular Josephine, we can't afford to buy gold. So, you know, I think the, the, the best we can hope for is probably a, a bag of coal or something and maybe grind the coal down and make it into a diamond. We'll have to do something with that. We will try and get one of these financial experts on the show sometime. And have a chat with them and kind of say to them, well, you know, by the way, you know, we can't afford gold and silver, just about yeah. able but to afford food. <laughs> I don't think we'd be able to afford to get a financial advisor on the show. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Anyway, um, Finn Fall, as you've probably <coughs> seen in the paper recently and uh, in the news, if you, if you read that, if you read the newspapers or watch the mainstream media or the lamestream media, um, has backtracked on their promises and now they're going to go ahead with Irish water. And I just can't believe that people actually are still voting for the likes of Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and Labour. Even, and they actually believed, you know, for a politician to knock on the door and say, oh, will you vote for us? We'll, um, we'll get rid of the Irish water. <clears throat> I, I still can't believe that they've, they've backtracked. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised they've backtracked or backpedaled. Um, but, I mean, what's going to happen out to all the people who are, have already registered, or deregistered or uh, cancelled their direct debits I mean, really? Are they going to start coming after people now? Is that is that kind of the modus operandi now? They're going to start coming after people. Well, there was this thing in the mainstream media saying Fianna Fáil were going to chase down the people who aren't paying. I mean, if we have fifty percent of people who haven't actually paid anything, and the people who cre- who cancel their direct debit say that brings them up to eighty percent. I mean, are they really going to try and chase 80% of the population? They don't have to even try and chase them. They're out there in the city centre every weekend. There's enough protest marches. You know, we're, we're out there. I mean, they know who we are. It's it's unbelievable. It's just com- it's just complete madness. The world has just gone mad. Anyway, Steve, you're next. Yeah, I'm next. You're Thank next. you. <laughs> I'm free. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago we mentioned um, that we may have an investor. Uh, interested in kind of furthering the career or the the journey of OIM. Now we said we were gonna we we would release more information as and when we got it. Now uh, at this moment in time we have to say that it kind of things are not it's it's a, kind of an, a, a no show at this moment in time because uh, for the simple reason we did have a meeting with the investor and we just kind of felt after the initial meeting which I think it lasted about five or six hours that in hindsight we were kind of we weren't going in the same direction 
there's a direction where we want to take OIM and it's clearly publicised on the website and we, we've mentioned it throughout the shows over the past six years and there is a direction where we are going and that direction and the agenda is just to help people and although the new direction would have been helping people it just wouldn't have been doing it the way we wanted to do it so at this moment in time that's kind of it's up in the air well it's 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 not so much up in the air but it's uh, it's knocked on the head at this moment in time exactly so we're just moving on there um, from that okay and we have updated our wish list on the website so if you fancy taking a wander over there and having a look at our wish list um, we know funds are very tight um, and we try and avoid putting any um, uh, donation thermometer up on the website for for and stuff like that because we know money is very tight so if you can if you like what we do and you can afford a few quid then it's much appreciated it'll go to good use here um, we, as I say, we're in the new Studio One with the new setup. Um, a big thanks to Chris for doing the new racking system for all the effects and stuff like that. And Chris got a first-hand view of OAM Towers on Walton's Mountain <laughs> and, um, and and how things are set up and how it all works. And um, I, I think he was pretty impressed. I think he liked it. And um, Chris is on the chat at the moment, so I think he was. Um, I think I think he liked it there. But um, how's your week, Steve? Yeah, all good, all good. Yeah, I have to say, Chris, Chris, and I've said it before, and I will say it again. The man has a gifted pair of hands. Uh, he, he has he has got a club foot, but he's got a gifted pair of hands. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the wish list actually there on the website. I don't see my uh, Cadillac. Is uh, will that be going on shortly? <laughs> the, the pink Cadillac? No, uh, no. Okay. Uh, no, it was a, a, a good week. I have to say, over the past couple of days in Ireland here, we have had fantastic weather. Absolutely fantastic. It was beautiful today. Uh, very well. Actually, I didn't see any chemtrails today. I seen chemtrails yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, but um, that's a good day for Paddy's day. It was a very good day for Paddy's day. Yeah, on the seventeenth, and as I mentioned earlier on the chat room, uh, one of the villages not too far away from me, uh, a little place called Delvin, and um, they generally have their parade on the Sunday, so they had that today, and it was fan- absolutely fantastic. Uh, great weather, but I think yesterday I did see a lot of chemtrails yesterday. Uh, when I was we were out out in the boat, so um, you know we're still not winning the war on that one. But I think Terry in Wexford, Terry Lawton down in Wexford, he is still out on uh, on the street, pounding the beat on the street, and he's educating people. He's got a lot of videos up there on YouTube as well about geoengineering. Uh, Terry Lawton is his name. If you want to check his videos out, go do that and subscribe to him. He's uh, he's kind of a one man a one man wrecking crew is is what he is for for troop media he really is. Uh, what else we got on the um, on my my kind of agenda? Uh, I was just telling Alan before we went live. I was uh, in, watching a couple of videos on YouTube uh, from a chap in Canada, and he's he's kind of he, I think he complements what we do. He's kind of like a, a Canadian version of OYM, insofar as he's just an, he's any man on the on the street, uh, and as his, his tagline is, he's just a guy who knows some stuff. And he has a lot of stuff, and a fantastic website as well, um, just loads of information. And we may, we may be looking at getting, getting him on a future show because he's, he's just, uh, the, the guy just has so much information. And for after watching his videos, it's just, it's layman's terms. It really is, uh, you know, anyone can understand them. If I can understand them, anyone can understand them. And, uh, he has a lot of, a lot of, um, good information coming out there. Uh, from that kind of side of things where people can take control of their own health and um, just, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that we can be, we can be doing and should be doing. And after after we just heard from uh, Catherine Albrecht as well, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. A lot of food stuff that we continue to eat and we need to just we need to just get rid of them out of the, out of the kitchen completely. And that's all the soy products. And anyone out there like me who will be, say, vegetarian, vegan, who... Would you soy milk? There's a plenty of alternatives, as Catherine mentioned during the show. Like there's a, a lot of alternatives out there. Uh, anyway, I know we're, we're toy for time, so there was a couple of other yokes I wanted to mention, but no. I won't. I'll put them out. Huh? Well, you didn't mention you have a bit of time if you want to have a chat with them, mm. chat about it. Okay, right. Well, it's kind of all just based around YouTube videos because I found myself I found myself in a YouTube frenzy one one evening and I just kind of start watching videos and I say. This chap in, in Canada, like his name is Tony. Uh, if you can check him out as well, check out Terry's videos. Um, and yeah, I was looking at some stuff as well. This is kind of something that I, I spoke to Alan about as well. And um, paranormal stuff. I know, like we 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 
we kind of cover ET stuff from time to time, but there was uh, some paranormal stuff just kind of come up my radar it, for no apparent reason, just kind of saw from YouTube, and it came up, and uh, I was blown away by by this chap, Steve Steve Huff, over there in the in the US of A. I don't know if anyone has heard of him. See me, he's a big wig in the, in the paranormal scene, and uh, uh, what what he's doing there, speaking to alleged alleged and uh, dead entities. Just kind of, I was watching a lot, a lot of these videos, and it blew my mind. It really did. And um, yeah, well, do you know, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. We won't say anymore. Right? How was your week? Okay, not too bad. Now there was a query in the chat room regarding uh, Catherine Albrook talking about smart meters, and said, "What do we do?" Well, what I did personally was to ring the uh, 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 ESB, basically whoever your electric provider is, and record the conversation and tell them that you are recording the conversation. And tell them that you don't want the smart meter. And have it on record that you don't want the smart meter. Um, and so if they do try and install it, you you can uh, tell them that you uh, you rang them up and you said that you removed their um, right of access to your property. And uh, if they uh, come on your property, they'll be trespassing. So that's something you could do anyway. I did that probably about two years ago. I think I rang them up, and they just quoted the Data Protection Act, and I said, I won't be putting this up on YouTube. I'm just telling you now over the phone that this is being recorded, and I do not want a smart meter. And then we left it at that. So that's uh, one way that you can do it. Now, um, things that happened during the week. Well, just the information that I've come across during the week. Now, we found out that during the week that Enda Kenny's father was also a politician, nepotism, and was in the doll when JFK was over here doing a speech uh, to the politicians in the 60s. Um, so, yes, nepotism comes to mind. Um, so I can just imagine Enda Kenny's father saying, Hey, son, go into politi- politics. You don't have to work hard, but you can get great money, and it'll set you up for life, and if you, can't, you can't get sacked, and uh, you can just destroy the country, and you'll get well paid, and you'll get a nice pension at the end of it, you know? So, um, and that seems to be the case. There seems to be a lot of families in politics getting involved and hiring their cousins and their nephews and their, their, their daughters and their sons and everything else. It's a gravy train that has to be stopped. It really is. It's seen as a gravy train and it really has to be stopped. Now, a story in the Irish Times, is on the Irish Times website, by the way, and the story was that a man who sexually assaulted a girl, 17, was put on probation. Now, the story says, um, a man who sexually assaulted a schoolgirl as she was working alone in a country shop and later accosted her as she walked home has been put on probation for a year. John Ring, 47, Dunbeg, Castlebar, County Mayo, initially pleaded not guilty at Galway Circuit Court to sexually assaulting the student 17 on July 22, 2014. He also denied harassing the girl later that day. He subsequently changed his plea to guilty of sexual assault. Judge Rory McCabe said this had been a very sinister incident. He said the offence merited a four-year sentence, but Ring had a complex and troubled background and a low risk of reoffending. Now, here's the kicker. This man happens to be the brother of a well-known Fine Gael TD in Mayo. There you have it. There's the kicker. Yeah. You know? Anything like that, you know, that's the story. Now, this was in the Irish Times, by the way, so I'm just reading what the Irish Times said. So does that so, mean if I was to kill, if I was to go and kill somebody and it was an isolated offence, I'd never, there was no chance of me ever doing it again, I'd get away with murder? Well, if your brother or sister was a TD, possibly, yes. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, just, it just adds to the list of corruption, really, doesn't it? Well, that's, that's the way the system works. And the last thing on the list was, I was told by my sister, and my sister does tune into the show, and... She told me about a mini TV series on Sky called Childhood's End. And um, I believe it's on now, but I did actually manage to see the the three uh, series um, in the whole show. And I have to say, it was very good. And basically, it's got to do with, funny enough, friendly ETs. And say friendly with inverted commas, bunnies ears and that. Um, Friendly ETs come to earth helping mankind. But there is a big twist at the end of it. And it just reminded me of another movie by Nicolas Cage. He starred in, and it was called Knowing. 
And if you look up uh, the IMDb database on, on Google, you'll find out about knowing. I think he's an MIT teacher, a professor who walks out with code that says that things are going to happen to the planet. And maybe it's just, maybe it's Hollywood again telling us about what's going on or what's coming down the line. I haven't a clue. I mean, I really, really don't know. There's so much information out there and there's so much disinformation out there that we can't really, you know, as John Irwin said, to try and find the truth in a barrel full of lies is very difficult. So all we can do is research, research, cross-reference, speak to people, interview people, see what they say, and see what happens. Now, I was looking at the whole Planet X thing, and obviously we had Tolak on last week. And there's people out there talking about Planet X in, in Nibiru, and is it going to come in, is it going to have a, an effect as it passes the planet? And there's a lot of people talking about this happening. But then again, if you go to the level higher up on that, which is what Tolek, Ray and Jim were talking about last week, they said, well, actually, the ETs are actually wrapping this planet, if it's uh, Nibiru, in some energy force. So when it does pass by, it actually doesn't have any effect on Earth. Now, the people on the lower levels, are they aware of this? I don't know. So that was kind of, I was kind of thinking that during the week. Um, maybe so. Maybe, maybe the next time we get somebody on, and they're talking about Planet X and, and Nibiru, we'll say this to them to see if they are familiar with it and see if they know about it. Um, the second sun has definitely been seen. There's loads and loads of photos out there on the internet, and um, and um, the uh, just uh, we're, we're having. I'll tell you, we are having um, seriously. We are having gremlins on the old um, computer side of things uh, at this moment in time. Steve's computer just decided, <laughs> for some unknown reason, that I was going to shut down. Um, okay. Um, so, I, I don't really know what's going on. We're going to have great fun with this podcast. There's going to be loads and loads of editing anyway. <laughs> loads and loads of uh, editing to be done. Um, you're back up and running anyway, Steve? Yes. Yeah, okay. Just um, What have you done? I don't know. That's, the, that's technology for you. But, it's um, Chris. Chris put, put a... Woodworm in it or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Chris made a statement on the chat there, and it's much appreciated, Chris, that uh, Chris did pay a visit to the studio, and he designed the racks for us, and he said that um, he can guarantee that the uh, donations are going to the right cause and uh, helping to build the studio, and that's much appreciated, Chris. Thanks a lot and for saying was, that. And uh, he was well fed while he was here, too. Well, we, 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 yes, yes, we did. We had a bit of food. We gave Chris a bit. Of, you have to feed the workers, don't you? Well, I have to say, and I said, I did say this, and Chris said it as well, and it's gonna, it's, it's now being publicly said. Alan makes fantastic soup. Well, it's, um, no, it was, it was beautiful soup. And Chris, um, watch the chat room. I'm sure Chris will say the same. Um, uh, organic, organic vegetable soup. Organic vegetable soup. Mm. Well, everything being organic with uh, obviously uh, spring water. And um, yeah, it's just it was nice. It's nice uh, along with the the bit of food, um, just adds to it. But um, that's really uh, the story. Um, what happened? All the stuff that happened this week again. I'm fantastic that we had Paddy's Day. That we had the weather for Paddy's Day because normally it's raining, as most of you, most of you know. Most years Paddy's Day it's always raining and cold. So it was a bit of a shock when we seen the sunshine. Now next week we don't actually know who's going to be on next week. We put the feelers out for guests for next week. And nobody's got back to us yet, but as usual, we'll, we'll guarantee that we'll have somebody. Just keep an eye on the schedule and keep, uh, keep a watch out on what, uh, uh, what comes up there. Now, we also have a couple of other, um, irons in the fire of things that we're going to be looking at doing. One of these things that we're looking at doing is probably looking at setting up a crowdfunding solution, a solution for OIM. And again, we need to look at that. We need to research it and we need to, see if it's going to be possible, if it's going to be worth their while lo- looking into it. There's so many things that we'd love to be able to do. Again, it's all got to do with service to others. If you want to get an idea of what we're looking to do, pop over to the website and have a look at the 300k plan on the website. And that will give you kind of a, a hint of basically what we'd like to do. Yeah, that's 300,000, not 300 kilometers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're not, we're not going, to, going to be running the marathon or anything like that. 300k as in 300,000. Um, it's a, you know, we put it out to the universe and we'll just see what happens. But it's all got to do with service to others and making a change and making a difference as much as we can. That's really what the plan of attack is. And we're hoping to 
maybe start doing a couple of, of videos, maybe podcast podcast based initially, um, just really talking about certain things that we talk about, like the fluid belief system. Um, because I'm sure some people might question it or they might ask, hey, what is that? And to listen to what the fluid belief system is, you'd have to go back to a number of shows to listen to us saying it. And what we said we do is what we will try and do is make a YouTube video on a podcast and put it out there. So if people want to know what it is, all you have to do is go to a five or ten minute YouTube video that tells you all about the fluid belief system and, you know, how we came about kind of... Yeah. Or maybe, maybe we were talking about it. Maybe, and, you know, maybe if anyone has any ideas, anyone who's listening in, if you have any ideas on what should be, what content, or what, what you know, what what you feel should be in a, a video speaking about the fluid belief system, like what does the fluid belie- belief system mean to you? Uh, maybe you could just drop us an email info at oymradio dot com, and maybe we might include it in the video. Brilliant stuff. Okay, well we're going to um, finish up early because we're going to have a bit of work to do with the podcast. So, for myself, Alan James, take it easy, stay safe, and um, apologies for the tech- technological glitches tonight, but these things happen. It just uh, depends on the guest that's on, really. That's just the way it is. But uh, Yeah, it's good information. Um, good good information from Catherine, great information from David. I really enjoyed it. We, we enjoyed it, uh, being part of it as well. And big hi to everyone, or a big goodbye, sorry, to everyone who was tuned in on the chat room again, as Alan said, apologies for... Any of the little faux pas that happened this evening, but unfortunately it's out of our control. Uh, well, that's just the way it goes. So, uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a good week and maybe the weather might stay uh, sunny because I think everyone feels a lot better when the sun is shining. So let's, uh, let's, let's hope the weather just stays the way it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if Vin is back. I think Vin is, is back on PIR this evening. Uh, so he's going to be on right after we clear on peoplesinternetradio.com. If you're listening on the OAM radio stream, then we're going to say good night, sayonara, arrivederci, and uh, we catch you again in seven days' time. From myself, Stephen George, good night. Open your mind.